Hey, let's, we can go ahead and get started. Are we live, Harold? We are live and recorded. Great. Uh, welcome today. Uh, we have a loading people still and uh, uh, there will be other folks joining, but we want to go ahead and get started because obviously uh, one of the things we pride ourselves is making sure the trains run on time for uh, this particular democratic organization on, on timing and scheduling for a webinar. Today, as you all know, uh, we have a uh, very outstanding guest, someone who's kind of lived through epics in our history, and you'll have an opportunity to hear both from him and with our own Barbara Nowski about what we're seeing, what's happened, how it looks different, how it looks the same, and uh, we'll have, in addition to their visit, uh, an opportunity for at least 15, 20 minutes for questions, so if you haven't already thought of a question as it goes on, please go ahead and use the chat function. I want to give you a heads up on our September 24th seminar webinar as with all the other ones since the pandemic uh hcla has agreed to make them free to members and non-members alike it'll be on uh, criminal justice in the COVID era we'll have harris county uh, sheriff gonzalez the fort bend county da brian middleton uh, judge chris morton and uh, uh, natalia will also be joining us as a moderator for that event we also have already put on the calendar our October 29th uh, hybrid event. We're going to have our Clarence Darrow slash annual awards at the patio at the Hotel Zaza. Things continuing with a very limited in-person social distancing attendance as well as live CLA webinar so that everybody else will be able to join if they can't be there in person. Uh, now we have an opportunity to hear from someone who from our perspective as Democrats, really represents the best of what we have to offer voters in, in this particular district. Uh, Palestine Mayor, former Palestine Mayor Dr. Carolyn Salter, who's a physician, anesthesiologist, who's not only done public service already, uh, but has fought for the unions, has, has really done some outstanding things that voters in that district have an opportunity to look back on and recognize what Democrats in the State House can do. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salter, and we look forward to hearing from you now. Mute. Thank you so much, Mike. I'm Dr. Carolyn Salter, a physician and former two-term mayor of my rural East Texas town, Palestine. I'm running for Texas fifth congressional district. I graduated with an MD degree from UT Southwestern in Dallas in 1981, and I've operated a small private medical practice with my internist husband in Palestine for 30 years. I wanna thank Mike Doyle and the Harris County Democratic Lawyers Association for the invitation to speak thankfully before John Dean and not after. I want to thank the legal profession. Captain Chaos has eroded norms, hollowed out our institutions, and challenged the rule of law. You've been their first warriors and our last hope against this administration in their unified assault on our constitution, our democracy, and now our election process. On November 4th, we'll be counting on you guys to be the cavalry. A little bit about my district, it's two hours north of Houston, half the population of the 5th district is in southeast Dallas County, and then it extends about 150 miles into rural East Texas. My district is extremely important to Harris County because it, uh, it, it, uh, it has a large part of the Trinity, River, the Trinity River watershed, which provides you guys with 86% of your drinking water. My campaign platform emphasizes affordable, accessible health care, high speed broadband that's accessible and affordable to everyone, quality public education for everyone of every age, and combating the climate uh, crisis. The platform I outlined benefits my entire rural district as my urban rural district as well as Harris County. I will, I'll be, I will ask to be assigned to the Energy and Commerce, Science, Technology, and Space, and Agriculture Committees so that I can address my objectives as I outlined. My Republican opponent is a do-nothing Trump supporter who has the same voting record as Louis Gohmert, voted to defund the, the U.S. Postal Service, and spends all of his time on Fox News complaining about China instead of chatting with his constituents. We're not storming the beaches of Normandy to save our country from fascism, but we might as well be. Trump, by his own admissions, is rigging this election. The country is on the verge of catastrophe, and I, for one, will leave everything on the field to stop that. I hope you're with me. 
Even though I'm not from Harris County, I'm going to need help from across the state of Texas to win this district, and it is winnable. Please support Democrats across the state to turn this state blue. Ask your friends and family, especially the ones in my district, to vote from the top to the bottom of the ballot for Democrats. If we save Texas, we can save the world. So please go to SalterForCongress.com for information and to donate. Like me on Twitter and Instagram. I want to thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Let's heal America together. Thank you, doctor. Uh, that's actually a really good slogan. I like that. Although you do remind me there was a, a joke somebody in, in Dallas told me about Houston's water and how much of it comes from the Trinity River that flush twice, Houston really needs the water um, uh, on here. Let me go ahead and turn over now to Barbara Nowski, who will, will do the introduction for John Dean. Uh, and thank you again, doctor. By the way, just as a heads up in the chat, we've already placed the link so you can learn more about her campaign, what's happening in her district, how she's planning to actually make a difference and help heal the nation and, and support her, which I hope you all will, will join us in doing. Thank you again, doctor. And thank you, Barbara. Please go ahead. Ready. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Let me first, before I introduce John Dean, let me introduce the audience, y'all too, John Dean. Um, we are hundreds of lawyers and book law lovers, and we are thousands of social media future viewers for this program that's free and open to the public and being recorded. We are TDLA, that's the Texas Democratic Lawyers Association. Um, to be very short about it, uh, we give lawyers, legal professionals, and others the opportunity to save democracy. Uh, and we are asking that folks please sign up. We have the honor of here uh, on, this on this chat, we've got uh, Rose Clouston, who is the State Democratic Party's head person on voter protection. And we're honored to have her here. And she is posting uh, in a little while uh, the link to how you can sign up. We don't necessarily have to, you don't have to necessarily be a lawyer to help. Uh, there are certain positions we can train non-lawyers. So please know that the Texas Democratic lawyers are here and ask your help. Uh, at any one time, we are 750 to 1,000 lawyers strong, protecting the ballot to make voting safe for Texas lawyers. Um, and now let me introduce John Dean, uh, whose book could not be more apt for what Texas Democratic lawyers does. Uh, and let me say, there's much to admire in John. I'm allowed to call him John. Uh, we're, we're here primarily because of his and Professor Altermeyer's brilliant, remarkable, important research, which couldn't be more timely, as I say. Um, this is authoritarian nightmare. I'm sorry, my version is all uh, beaten up, uh, but it involves clear, important data. It's data rich, but it's understandable to non-data people. And it builds on his famous book, bestseller, Conservatives Without Conscience. But in addition to this, the brilliance of this book, Mr. Dean John uh, deserves our admiration for an entirely different reason, but it's very related because he writes about it in the book but he, it's quite understated. Um, when, you, when you look at and compare the man who wrote Blind Ambition, for those of you like me who were in law school in 1976 when Blind Ambition came out, we saw a hero. And the reason he was a hero was that he told the truth when no one else with inside information would. And he risked much to do so, and he paid a price for telling the truth. And it wasn't just the truth told, it was told the way a lawyer can tell the truth. It's for the same reason and using the same qualities he had that made him an honors graduate from Georgetown Law and made him the counsel to the President of the United States at age 31 where he served from 1970 to 1973. He also was counsel to the House Judiciary Committee and held other very important uh, volunteer positions 
for example, in uh, law reform. But it's the fact that he spoke the truth when no one else would and broke open Watergate that makes him the hero to those of us who were old enough to have been in law school in 1976 and realized what it meant and the lessons it taught us. And he's applied those lessons in his research that has culminated in this work. And we've asked him today to concentrate on that. And we wanted to afford him, therefore, the time to really give you a PowerPoint. But afterwards, the plan is we're going to ask questions, have a short conversation, uh, drawing on his experiences that are in the book. He had a conversation with Nancy Pelosi about impeachment. We are talking to living history. Uh, it's no surprise then when you compare the lawyer that is John Dean with the lawyer who was Richard Nixon. And the, the notions of the way trained lawyers act and when they make mistakes, when they own up to their mistakes and do the right thing had the effect of bringing about Watergate and its results. Uh, John teaches important CLE programs and has for years that examine the impact of the ABA model rules of professional conduct on select historic events and the lasting impact of Watergate on the legal profession. He was the Barry Goldwater Chair of American Institutions at Arizona State University, and he's long served the USC Annenberg School of Communications as a vi visiting scholar and lecturer. Folks, we could use some truth telling in the United States right now. And I can't think of any better truth teller who did a brilliant job with a superb memory and everything that we would want in a courageous witness as lawyers or as human beings. Let me turn it over to John Dean. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> I don't have spirals in my <laughs> book. Actually, my book disappears against the, uh, the, the green screen behind me. <laughs> I like that. It's kind of like a cookbook. Let me uh, share screen here and bring up the PowerPoint I have. Is that big on everyone's screen? Yes. I see Joe Jaworski uh, nodding. Hi, Joe. <clears throat> what I thought I'd do to put this in context, uh, I recently participated in a program with Larry Diamond, who is a friend at Stanford, uh, who was a part of the voter study group. They spent three years looking at authoritarianism in America and, uh, and uh, attitudes concluding in June of this year. I find this, the data that they assembled pretty startling. I'm just going to give you a couple highlights of it. Obviously, they found people are overwhelmingly in love with democracy, but boy, does that hide some really troubling information. For example, the polling showed one in three Americans say a strong leader is a good way to run the country. One in four say they would favor army rule in America. Fewer than half Americans would object to a president acting unilaterally. That should be without constitutional or congressional authority. Pretty amazing data. 41% say it's appropriate for the president to act unilaterally, quote, because a large majority of American people believe he should act that way. That this is a clear evidence that there's a deep sympathy within the United States for an authoritarian leadership. Very troubling. Now, authoritarian leadership, I just grabbed a quick definition for this PowerPoint uh, to make sure we're all on the same page. It, 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 I think everybody recognizes authoritarianism when they see it. We could spend a whole, I could write a whole book on authoritarianism but it's the enforcement or advocacy of a strict obedience to authority at the expense of personal freedom is the Oxford English Dictionary's definition and a pretty good one. But the authoritarianism I look at in the book 
is really the relationship of followers to leaders. We're more interested in the personality aspect of it rather than the political science aspect of it. But stripped to its essentials, authoritarianism happens when the followers submit too much to the authorities in their lives. This varies in different situations. What's too much? Well, it can be if the leader is lying, cheating, or stealing, but it can also be if they're ruling by undermining democracy, but it can also be accepting all those things. If you're interested in the subject, I think one of the great works is Hannah Arendt's The Origin of Totalitarianism. If you want a quick thumbnail of what authoritarianism looks like, uh, Timothy Snyder's on, on Tyranny is excellent. It's a quick read. Here are a couple other books. I happen to really like the title of The Dictator's Handbook, <laughs> Why Bad Behavior is Almost Always Good Politics. But these books can also tell us how frighteningly easy it is to slip across the line. Oops, move that too fast. I took my first dive in this subject back in 2005 and six. It was a book that was provoked by the late Senator Barry Goldwater, who was a lifetime friend. His son and I were roommates in prep school and we've remained uh, very close for a long time. We're like brothers. Actually, he introduced me to my wife. He said that was a mistake. I, he shouldn't have let her go. <laughs> he now realizes. But anyway, Barry's dad, the senator, had just left Congress and was deeply troubled by the religious right moving in and taking over the Republican Party and wanted to understand why. Uh, I started looking and was beginning to find some answers, and his health turned bad. Uh, so we, I put the project on the shelf and then pulled it out a number of years later and finished it up. The person who helped me uh, greatly on that study was a researcher and psychology professor at the University of Manitoba up in Canada, an American by the name of Bob Altemeyer. Uh, Bob is now the collaborator with me on this book. Uh, he has devoted his life to studying authoritarian personalities, particularly those who follow authoritarian leaders. So his work uh, was, a, uh, was a really good starting point. He, he and I talked during the campaign when Trump emerged, and there was just no question that barking dog is my phone. Let me turn that off. My barking dog's are not in my office today. Um, when Trump emerged, we both were confused why the media was not really digging out who these people were that were propping him up. He was a conspicuous demagogue, so why not more attention to who his followers were? Well, finally, as the campaign and the primary proceeded, one reporter, Amanda Taub, who was at the time at Vox, did write a piece called The Rise of American, American Authoritarianism, and she'd noticed a small group of political scientists who actually are studying a sliver of the broad-based science that exists on authoritarian followers, and a lot of the press did quote her. Uh, Trump's opponents certainly made no uh, qualms, had no qualms about calling him the demagogue he was and is. Uh, Lindsey Graham, Ted Cruz, even Stephen Hawking. So when the New York Times finally took a, a study of all of his campaign rhetoric, uh, brought in political scientists and uh, other historians and concluded that he was definitely a demagogue. Uh, only later did they go to the authoritarian word. I don't know, I, I'm not quite sure why the reluctance. Anyway, Altmeyer and I uh, were talking all the way along and I finally, in July of 2017, uh, 
did an did an interview with Bob in my column. I since I've been at CNN, I haven't. I'm still on the masthead at Verdict to write biweekly columns, but I unfortunately uh, the post at CNN has been too consuming to do so. Although it it, it uh, post impeachment and with the arrival of COVID nineteen has given me more time and I was able to finish the book. But anyway, I talked to him and said, listen, this science just can't remain buried because people can't understand what they're dealing with with Trump's base. And this base is not going anywhere when Trump's gone. He agreed. So we collaborated drawing on his science and others uh, to present who these people are. I'm going to give you just the broadest overview of this social science because I think it's important to understand. It is a little wonky, but not very. I did a prior book on it, <clears throat> as I say, The Conservatives Without Conscience, that stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for about five weeks. Uh, when Trump arrived, it started selling again. It's actually, I noticed that Amazon has paired it with this book. Uh, so it will still be be uh, active, it looks like. But the personalities involved break down into three general categories. They're people who are social dominance orientation scale uh, reveals their social dominance uh, is one group. They're the leader types. There are the follower types. They are tested by something called the right wing authoritarian scale. Then there's a unique type of personality who is both a social dominator, but also uh, tests high as a right-wing authoritarian, means, meaning they're submissive. This is almost a oxyboron, if you will, uh, because they uh, are dominators who are willing to submit, but it's really when you find out what they're submitting to, they're submitting to their own leadership and dominance. So here are the three personalities in, that uh, make up the world of authoritarian uh, leaders and followers. Let's look just a little bit deeper at each. The social dominance orientation scale is about a little over a decade old, whereas the study of the followers has been going on really since World War II. The, uh, key personality traits is the the dominating personality and Richard Nixon's an interesting uh, example because he was he, he was a dominator behind closed doors uh, you didn't see his he was not a demagogue uh, and if we didn't have the Nixon tapes people might not realize that uh, he was a uh, clear authoritarian personality. And he responded and dealt differently with different people. Uh, Donald Trump, on the other hand, is a social dominator in the Rose Garden. He wears it and plays it everywhere. The other trait is they these people believe in inequality. This is a classic picture of George Wallace uh, being confronted by Nitz, uh, Nick Katzenbach, uh, the deputy attorney general uh, in the famous schoolhouse door episode. The, uh, the social dominators desirous of personal power. They're certainly a epitome of, of that personality trait and they're all amoral. So here are the traits for the social dominator. Uh, dominating personality, oppose equality, desirous of personal power, and amoral. We've had presidents who do hit all these criteria. Andrew Jackson, certainly. Woodrow Wilson, certainly. Richard Nixon, and now Donald Trump. They also test uh, consistently with other traits that seem to be, not all of them will have all the traits, but many of them will indeed show uh, traits of Im intimidating and bullying. <coughs> Excuse me, they're faintly hedonistic. They are vengeful. They're pitiless, exploitive, manipulative, dishonest, cheat to win, 
highly prejudiced, mean-spirited, militant, nationalistic. I had that list in Conservatives Without Conscience long before Donald Trump arrived, and I can't tell you how many uh, emails I got from readers who said, boy, you certainly understood who Trump was before he arrived on the scene, which is true. But the dominator is really kind of a fool on a soapbox without followers. They do make the, the dominator into something more than a, uh, a long-winded demagogue with nothing to say other than what he wants to hear. So the study of the authoritarian followers has been much longer than that of, of the leaders. Uh, with the rise and fall of Hitler and Mussolini and the massive crowds that not only were uh, voluntarily following these, these men and those who were conscripted as well, some willingly, it, it resulted in a group of scientists uh, going to Berkeley. These were Eastern European Jews who escaped uh, the Nazis and began a study of the authoritarian personality, wondering if, if what had happened in Italy and Germany could happen here, where people had willingly submitted to these people and allowed them to lead their countries. The, the work of this group of scientists uh, surfaced in a book in 1951 called The Authoritarian Personality. The book was very controversial at the time. The science behind the book, much of it was Freudian psychology, which did not hold up. The fact that there is an authoritarian personality, however, did hold up because other scientists began using non-Freudian approaches to test and, and through interviews and uh, other examinations of people found there clearly is an authoritarian type personality. Uh, and that primarily being the authoritarian followers, the right wing authoritarian scale was developed and has really been replicated and confirmed over the last 40 years as being clearly a, a, a very distinguishable personality. This is a list just for me to remind me to, to, to take you through some of the traits that the right-wing followers have. Uh, the key, key traits, the, what qualifies them is they're submissive to authority. They are, <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't find a good picture of a submissive to authority, but when looking, I did find this, this fella, and this is sort of the epitome of submissiveness to authority, uh, willingly. Sorry about that. Uh, they are aggressive on behalf of that authority. We have seen a lot of this, and we're seeing a lot on the streets right now. The caravans in Portland. We're having them here in California, Trump caravans, where they are uh, riding down the street, firing uh, paint guns at people who gather to watch them. Uh, this is the type of aggression that reaches all kinds of levels and fortunately has not gone violent yet. <coughs> and we must hope it doesn't. Uh, they're very conventional people. Excuse me, let me get back to this. They're very conventional people. And I look closely at the crowd at one of the Trump rallies. And th this is certainly a very conventional group of people. Uh, they would not stand out in a crowd. To test all this science that, uh, as I say, had been around for almost a half century now, as we started this book, while Altmaier was very able to recognize these people, having uh, worked with them and tested them uh, throughout uh, his career, and those tests have been done on relatively small samples in university towns, in Canada, some, a lot of the science we were, were, were relying on was, had been done in Canada, uh, but there were, uh, there were replicated tests in campus towns throughout the country of both students and their parents. So the question was, how solid was this science? Did it apply uh, to voters in the United States today? 
And that was a, a, a question hanging over our head as we plowed through this material. And then in the fall, uh, I have uh, known for a number of years the man who runs the Monmouth University Polling Institute. It's one of the better polling institutes, uh, Nate Silver, who runs 538 and, and has a collection of all the key polls, has given Monmouth one of his few gold stars because of the, the uh, independence and skill with which they do their polling. Anyway, I went to Patrick and told him about this book uh, that I was working on. He was actually very interested in the subject. Uh, I hope that buzzing noise isn't distracting you all and you don't even hear it. Uh, I'm under construction at my home. Uh, another story. But anyway, the Mammoth Poll, uh, we, had, we developed a, a, a base of about 230,000 people. They designed, after trying it in New Jersey, a survey system where the key personality tests could be administered online. We tried them on the phone, we tried them uh, in person, and an online platform proved to be the most successful because the uh, people taking the poll could do it in about 35, 30 to 35 minutes most. Uh, so we were able to get a poll of about 990 people that was representative of both pro and anti-Trump uh, voters, just a re fairly representative sample right across the spectrum. And the polling results were quite startling. For Altmaier, it was a eureka moment because it validated his entire career. Uh, for me, it was a real eye-opener because these authoritarians are out there. Uh, from when I had looked at them first in 2005, 2006, uh, what is stunning is that they have all moved into the Republican Party. Uh, that's obviously been an ongoing process, but uh, the double highs who have the least attractive personality traits uh, are solidly migrated and gone to roost in the Republican Party. Long story, short story for uh, activists like yourself, these are people you can't persuade to do anything. They're going to vote for Trump come hell or high water. A few at the edges will peel off, but not many. Uh, you can't be rational with them. They are inconsistent in their thinking. They are highly compartmentalized in their rationalizations where they pack things away. We describe them in some detail, particularly the right-wing authoritarian followers, and that will be the bulk of the people. They are, <clears throat> excuse me, they are the uh, the one of the two pillars of the, uh, let me back all the way up. There are two pillars in his base. Uh, there are white men without four-year college degrees are one pillar. The larger pillar and the core of his base are really white evangelicals and born-agains. And most of them are the overwhelming majority of them are right-wing authoritarians, not that there aren't a good grouping of social dominators and double highs. But the number of double highs in the United States is on the rise and is quite striking. The most uh, telling underlying revelation of Trump's base is the depth of the prejudiced. These are the most prejudiced people any president may have ever brought into a coalition in American history. So it's little surprise that Trump is out there with his fear and loathing campaign because that's the only way he's gonna keep his base. These, this is what they wanna hear. This is what they believe. Uh, he can keep them in line by trying to stir up their fears and warming their hearts with prejudice. So with those general remarks, uh, let's go to out of sharing screen and to you, Barbara, who've been calling questions. Yes. Um, 
I, I'd like to start with one from the audience because it's somebody who is a, a, a scholar, uh, but a very big Galveston area and Bay Area uh, near, near Galveston Bay activist named Mike Haley, who um, has followed you and Professor Altemeyer and the prior research from World War II. And he, he constantly quotes conservative without conscience and your finding that probably about 20 to 25 percent back then of the adult American population is so right-wing authoritarian, so scared, so self-righteous, so ill-informed and so dogmatic, nothing you can say or do will change their minds. And they are so submissive to their leaders, they will always believe and do virtually anything they are told. They are not going to let up and they're not going to go away. That's 2006. He has two questions for you. The first is, who, I mean, he's, he's looking for identities. Who are the double high right-wing authoritarians in our current national leadership, executive, legislative, and judicial? And his second question, and I'll, I'll repeat him again, because uh, I know I'm throwing a lot at you. Has the 20 to 25% estimate of RWA increased, right-wing authoritarianism, I guess he means, increased since 2006? And Mike says he estimates 28% of eligible voters will vote Trump in 2020. Good questions. The two questions are, name names as to who the double highs are. And the other is, is my 25% uh, number still good? Yes, sir. Uh, we could spend the rest of the week talking about names of names. Let me just give you a... a uh, a very, well, Donald Trump is a poster boy, double high. Uh, Mark Meadows is a poster boy, double high. Mark Meadows was a big deal in the Tea Party, then the Freedom Caucus, and now, and, and he was the dominating figure in there. And now he's sort of, sub, be, submissive, he's become submissive and become chief of staff. Uh, so that's a, a very interesting and consistent trait of a double high who will who will become submissive to get greater power for himself and they're almost always he on the double highs and not she's there are very few uh, women who fill these things but anyway it's a long list when i did conservatives without conscience i did profiles of about a half a dozen uh, double highs I thought about doing that in this book and, and, and didn't. I blended them in as enablers and picked out three, Pence, Pompeo, and Barr. Those are three double highs and uh, they are dangerous men uh, for lack of a better uh, description of them. Now, is the 25% number I had it back in 2006, 2007 still accurate? We think it's low, uh, particularly based on our polling. Uh, it, it, it appears to be low. The, the Trump approval rating, which has gone from, is low on some polls as, as 35%, and never high on any poll uh, over maybe 44, 45, some flukish ones out 46, 47 percent. These are these are the uh, the base, uh, but they stay it stays in uh, typically around 40 percent range. The reason uh, the reason it fluctuates at all because there is one group with whom it doesn't fluctuate at all, about 35% of them, it doesn't move, are the independents. They, they can be uh, influenced from week to week, episode to episode. So that's the best answer I can give to that good question. Uh, you've got uh, a specific question from uh, Henry Jones about whether or not there are psychological pre-employment screenings or profilings done for White House jobs, and if not, should they occur? And um, have there been 
specific trade route recommendations. There's, there's going to be a series of questions I'm seeing about what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And this one from Hank is really specific about medical or psychological improvements. Um, there is, there are no kinds of examinations whatsoever for anybody in the White House from the top down. I did a tweet the other day because it struck me that Donald Trump probably couldn't pass a civil service exam. He couldn't become a postal carrier. Uh, he doesn't know enough about, he doesn't even have a good newspaper knowledge of how his government works. He's the most ignorant man we've ever had in the Oval Office. So that shows you, I mean, he would, nobody would ever, no other president would ever put somebody like this in his cabinet. He tried to get into Reagan's cabinet uh, and they were smart enough to keep him out. Uh, so no, and he, he has hired people with little uh, to no qualifications. I mean, his Jared and Ivanka, uh, they didn't have a clue about Washington before they went and they're learning on the job, whatever they're learning. So no, he has not, uh, there, there aren't, there is no testing, there's no psychological testing. And I doubt there could be other than a very good interviewer uh, who weeds out people who uh, might appear to be, have, be coping with some problems. You've got a question about how media, and particularly this question is about Fox News, affecting the concentration of right-wing authoritarianism in the Republican Party. And again, a solution question, how can its influence be tempered? Let me give you an overall solution question is, how do you, how do you deal with these people uh, coming up in the coming election? Uh, as I said, you can't persuade them to anything. There's only, only uh, and Altmeyer and I talked about this at length because it's not a prescriptive book because there are really no uh, effective ways to deal with these people. They, to use Donald Trump's term, they are what they are. This is what it is. They are there. Uh, while a few of them are upset when they learn that they are as prejudiced as they are, they want to be seen as regular people and and uh, not exceptional in any way. This can this can change some behavior at the fringes, uh, according to the science that Bob has looked at and worked with. But it, it it's rare. And he he said the the short answer is don't try to influence these people because you can't. Uh, it won't work. And the only thing they under, will understand is a tsunami election where they are shown that uh, there are people who love their democracy, who do not appreciate their undemocratic thinking and behavior, and that it isn't the way it's going to be in the United States. Maybe they ought to be looking for another country because this is just not the way this country works and operates best. So uh, there is no way to, to deal with them other than to uh, the vigilance needed to keep a democracy because these people are always going to be around and trying to nibble away at the system that we all love. It sounds, it sounds as though we've gotten to really uh, the essence of your book in what you've said, uh, but the details of the book, using examples, explaining to even the most uh, earnest person who would like to persuade others. Uh, what struck me about the book was just how compelling for the first time with, with something so rich in data, we see how fruitless it is with the exception of what I, if I recall is if somebody is capable of shame, um, there may be a little bit, that may be the nibbling at edges you're talking about. Right. And if so, uh, it, you give such rich examples of how Barr, Pompeo, Pence, how they fit into these various areas. What are you, and you've talked to Nancy Pelosi about impeachment, and it will not surprise a lot of uh, the folks here that I'm going to ask you a little bit about impeachment. What, it, what are your opinions on the strategic use of impeachment? Um, I'm going to say right now, as you may know, Barr is subject, there is a resolution to impeach him now that's been put in the hopper and has been examined. Uh, 
Adam Schiff had started intelligence hearings before the specific impeachment was instituted that was then broadened uh, because Adam Schiff's impeachment language covered the entirety of anything that was mentioned in the Mueller report and the entire breadth of uh, impeachable misconduct vis-a-vis -vis betrayal of trust. So given that impeachment can occur at any time if the House in its sole power wants to do it, do you have thoughts on the strategic use of impeachment to educate people, not to send it to the Senate, but on education of people to motivate them to get out and vote? Uh, I have deep and many thoughts about impeachment. I'm, as you mentioned, a former counsel to the House Judiciary Committee. Back in my, it was one of my first jobs in government and through unique circumstances, I rose to the top of the stack quickly and I had access to files because we looked at some impeachments, some judicial impeachments uh, while I was with the committee and I dug into some really historic documents one of the most conspicuous things to me uh, uh, as an insider looking around is the lack of capacity of the House uh, Judiciary Committee to conduct impeachment investigations. Uh, they never have had that skill or ability. They didn't have it during Watergate. They didn't have it during Clinton. They rely on outside people to bring them the, the problem. Uh, it, it, with, with judges, it, it, the judge nearly has, uh, virtually has to be in jail and a judicial form of some kind, bring them a signed, sealed, and complete file for them to undertake the impeachment proceeding. Same with, it was true during Watergate. They relied on the Senate Watergate Committee uh, and the Watergate Special Prosecutor. So the committee, I think the House, has shirked it, its responsibility on impeachment. If, if, if I had the power, uh, or maybe if I had a long conversation with the speaker, uh, I could convince her that what they ought to have is a permanent uh, select committee on impeachment, where it is, it is there, it's got the best and the brightest staff, uh, it had developed some institutional uh, standards, and it's ready to impeach uh, whenever it's called for. The House has, has become so wimpy that now the D.C. Circuit won't even let it enforce its subpoenas. Uh, that's going to get overturned. That was a, that was a three-judge panel. That's going to get overturned by the full court, uh, just as uh, other uh, fluky little panels of have, have, uh, have Trump-appointed judges are making disruptive decisions. But uh, meanwhile, it's time for the House to, to build the machinery so it can enforce its own uh, subpoenas. They once had a prison in the basement of the House. Uh, well, it's time that they use that inherent power again. And that could be a part of an impeachment committee where if, if a Bill Barr says, I'm not coming up and testify, well, they go down and get him and, and impeach him. and 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 uh, have some real muscle. Otherwise, the, 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 they're, they're not an equal branch. They, as it is now for lawyers who have not looked at this, they have to rely on the executive branch to enforce our subpoenas. Uh, when the House impeached, or excuse me, when the House subpoenaed uh, Eric Holder and he didn't want the subpoena, obviously the Department of Justice under him didn't enforce it. You know, either side ought to be able to enforce their subpoenas. That ought to be uh, something that cannot be disrupted. The the the, the uh, our federal judiciary takes care of itself. The U.S. versus Nixon is a subpoena case, and they made sure that they had their power to enforce that subpoena against the president, as Joe Jaworski, who's on my screen now, certainly knows. Um, yes, sir. So there, Barbara, there's much that needs to be done with the, uh, with the mechanics and processes of government. Uh, Republicans are good at ruling, not good at governing. Democrats are very good at governing, and they know how the process works. If Trump is defeated, I think it's going to be like post-Watergate. You're going to have several years, maybe even a decade, of enactment of laws uh, that will enhance the government powers of, say, the, the, uh, the legislative branch, 
and they will put some more guardrails on the uh, on the executive branch because as Trump has tumbled those norms, he's shown how weak they really are. Well, we are, we're overwhelmed with now a series of questions as we watched the grandson of uh, Leon Jaworski hanging out with you a few years ago. <laughs> and I will say, Karen Patman, who is the granddaughter of Wright Patman, who had the hearings in uh, scheduled uh, right before the re-election of Richard Nixon. They were in October of, of 72. Yes, sir. And uh, there was an Oval Office meeting, you recount, in Blind Ambition, uh, Chapter 5, I think, where you show how effective the presidency was and the co-conspirators were in stripping the House of its subpoena power. And Wright Patman, who was on it, on the case, trying to find out the financial information and what he couldn't get from his own Congress people in his own committee of banking and currency, he was thwarted in getting what you were just talking about. Well, what, that, what was done there was a vote. They voted for subpoenas and the White House used its influence on both Republicans and Democrats to, to block that vote. Uh, it really wasn't messing with the process as much as arm twisting in the more traditional uh, legislative style. Yes, and and the the whole notion of the whole notion of impeachment is would be a matter for a we could do a whole day on that. But you've got several questions that I wanted to kind of throw them out at you and see you if you could kind of wind your well, way. I know you're you're a an expert uh, as a counsel for citizens on that issue. Well, uh, there's a lot of lawyers here that are trial lawyers that are ready to volunteer for just the kind of capacity you talk about the kind of folks that will for free come and be the kind of lawyers that would be needed to put on a real Well, the last part of the book, I deal with what sort of behavior will an authoritarian uh, like Trump and his uh, followers tolerate to disrupt this election. And it's just, uh, we went through a, a visualize what a Trump playbook would look like. Well, he's playing that out uh, just about in every instance as we predicted. And that's where you need lawyers to, uh, to help out on a lot of these things. This voter suppression is going to get out of hand. Uh, he, in our Mammoth poll, we found that 25% of, of his supporters will literally tolerate him saying, if the election doesn't go his way, it was rigged and resists and try to disrupt the election results. There's gonna be plenty of need for attorneys uh, come election day, and there are lots of groups that are preparing for that now and uh, trying to anticipate what they might do and how they would do it to be ready to step up and deal with it. Well, I appreciate, I appreciate the emphasis in your, in your, in your uh, book, and Rose has just put, published, and there's several questions about how can we help. Rose has just published on the site the uh, textdem.co backslash TVLA, and we, we literally uh, have tens of thousands of hotline questions that are answered by volunteer lawyers, and we have literally the need for, at any point in time, hundreds and hundreds of lawyers to serve in these various capacities. So your emphasis on it uh, couldn't be more together. There are several questions. One specific one, if there's still time. Uh, oh, somebody actually, if can I jump in? I promised Judge Jaworski, who we all got to see, just a brief uh, chance, because obviously, you know, we've got some historic significance. And I've got one special question I need to put in. Uh, okay. Joe, you're, you have an announcement. Uh, not now, but what are you planning coming up? Sure. In 2022, running for Texas Attorney General. And are you going to wear these earplugs the whole time? I, I'm going to take him out on the campaign trail. Good. Thanks. And Joe, we all know you as the uh, mayor, two terms in Galveston and uh, active uh, in community life. Uh, do you have any questions? I mean, obviously, you've, you've had a chance to spend time with Mr. Dean before. Anything that comes to mind? Because I've got actually two that I want to make sure we, sure. Turn, we turn it back over to Barb. And, and John, please forgive me for not you know, returning your great salutation. At the beginning of the meeting, I was slow on the mute button. Uh, but it is great to see you again. Uh, that picture was uh, from the Texas Democratic Convention in 2008, photo credit Vince Leibovitz. Um, 
Mr. Dean, your book is so timely and so welcome right now. Um, there was mention in your book of, you know, prior authoritarians and, you know, Joe McCarthy and Richard Nixon and others. Uh, there were humbling moments to each of those, uh, you know, the, the, the Welch rejoinder uh, to Joe McCarthy, uh, Senator Goldwater and Al Haig uh, telling the president, the, you know, the gig is up. And, and there was some humility that allowed that episode in both cases to end. I heard you carefully today to suggest that nothing like that is ever going to happen with President Trump. And, and the only thing that well, it could I, be... Well, I, I would qualify that, Joe. Yeah. I would say that a tsunami election is the one thing he will get. And it, it, that will be hard to, for him to, uh, to wiggle around, to excuse and dismiss. And the, what will happen, I see, as, as Altmar and I sifted through all the numbers, is if young people vote. Now, I have appealed to, I'm confident my grand, three granddaughters, college age granddaughters, are gonna do their part and get their friends to do their part. But if everybody focuses on getting young people to the poll, because they're not, well, statistically they have done it in the past, they're not very good at it on a steady basis. They need to step up uh, and that's where the vote could really be influenced. I totally agree. And, and my concern is that as we see the polling, which, you know, is a little beyond me. I mean, I do not hold myself out as a pollsters. The numbers seem too tight uh, for my taste. And do you believe, have you done any speculation as to how this plays out in the courts following November 3rd? Well, there's so many permutations and combinations that uh, the most dangerous one would be and the most risky for <clears throat> Trump uh, supporters and apologists would be to try to flip uh, electors and to get a, uh, a, a, a your own slate, a governor send his own slate of electors to the electoral college. That, as I say, would be gamey, but it's probably one of the things that's in their in their uh, their thinking. Uh, whether it'll happen or not, I don't know, but more likely. Uh, if they try to cause a lot of problems between the election and January 8th, when the cutoff date is and it's not resolved, I'm just perfectly happy with Nancy Pelosi becoming president. <laughs> right. Thank you. Uh, two questions, and, and thank you. We're going to run over, so we'll have time for more questions. This is only the second time, Mr. Dean, that we've run over, and obviously you're an important enough speaker to, to be able to do it. The first question is kind of one that occurred to me when you were going through your PowerPoint and you, you came up with the, the only photo you could find on Google is a submission to authority is of a dog. Uh, do you have a filter that I need to make sure my kids have on their Google uh, for searches? Well, <laughs> I, I don't. I did see uh, some sexual submission, which I passed over on Google. So please don't go there. <laughs> that's, that's all. And here's, here's the, the final question before I turn it back over to uh, Barb. And thank you for doing this again on behalf of all the members, all the non-members participating. Uh, and this is a hopeful question. It's a long distance question kind of from Georgia, one of our, one of our watchers. Looking ahead, not jinxing, that this election turns out like we all hope and pray it will. Do you have any thoughts, having been through Watergate firsthand, on if there is investigations, if there is any kind of oversight that actually is going forward about what's been happening and as it's continuing, what the most high priority investigation or investigations ought to be? Well, you know, I was always one who uh, understood why the, the, one president, a new president, doesn't prosecute his predecessor. It's kind of a terrible precedent. Um, I was troubled when George W. Bush and Dick Cheney uh, started engaging in war crimes. I didn't think in his darkest days, Richard Nixon would have gone there. And those, of course, were just shunted aside by the Obama presidency. Joe, uh, Joe Biden, I think, has been asked how he would deal with Trump. Would he prosecute crimes? And I think he said yes. Uh, I suspect that'll come up again in the debates, and it's an issue that's not going to go away. It's my impression that one of the th reasons that Trump so fears losing is that he can be prosecuted. 
Now, whether it will be federal or not, I don't know. Uh, Cyrus Vance isn't going to be impressed with him being an ex-president. Cyrus Vance once yielded to the Trump family and gave uh, Ivanka and Jared a walk. Uh, it was politically very damaging for him. He's not going to do it again. And so I think that Trump's in real trouble. I, I, as I told my wife, uh, Maureen, I said, you know, maybe the reason Trump moved to Florida is he hopes DeSantis won't extradite him to New York if Vance uh, prosecutes him. <laughs> we haven't had a good state to state uh, extradition fight in a long time, but Trump's pretty good at stirring up fights. So I, I, you know, I don't know where this is going to go after the election if, if, if Biden is the, the victor. I think the tradition of the Democrats is not to play dirty, is not to start a precedent like that. So there, I don't think there will be a lot of federal prosecutions against really high level people. Even if Barr has committed crimes as attorney general, he'll probably get a pass. So what I do think they, they may do, and I think Congress has got enough to, to look at it for quite a while, is expose the behavior and show it for what it was. And that can be healthy. Thank you, sir. Uh, and then uh, before I turn it over to Barb, we are gonna go for at least another six minutes. So we'll, we will extend our time. I wanted to thank Dr. Salter again. Remember her information for her campaign is, is on your chat function. Uh, and really would behoove you to learn more about what she's doing up in that neck of the woods. And thank you again, Joe Jaworski for joining us. Good luck for those candidates. And, and right now, the good news is he's not hitting hard. He understands there's a fight that's got to be won in November for not just the top of the ticket, but all the way down the ballot here in Texas. Barb, thank you for doing this. And go ahead and, and we'll keep going for at least another uh, six or seven minutes if you have time, Mr. Dean. Yes, sure. If we're going to extend it, let me say that we have dozens and dozens of questions coming over. My well, we phone. shouldn't extend it too long. I promised to take my wife to get her flu shot. I've had mine, and, and that's so, important for everybody there to get their flu shot. <laughs> absolutely. And so the reason I mentioned that we don't have enough time is one of the questions comes from the head of the Meyerland Democrats. His name's Art Cronin, and he wants to put together a consortium of clubs that would invite you back. Um, and so either here or now, or maybe I, I can talk to you later. Uh, there, there, there are dozens of questions I'm getting both on the chat and through my phone. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is say you are much wanted back. The clubs on the Democratic side don't have the kind of fees that are paid for. Uh, I know what your CLEs and your brilliant uh, speeches garner at these massive conventions. Um, so You've got some requests that before the election, they'd like to uh, hear from you again, and we can chat about that. Uh, well, this book's a good handbook for activists. It's, yes, sir. And the, the book, by the way, well, we'll talk. We can, we talk can, get, we can get some discounts yeah. on that. Yes, and, and the book is from Melville House, uh, which also published, I have to disclose my book on impeachment. Um, and they are... They're wonderful people, and they have uh, proposed to put this recording on the C-SPAN uh, uh, for the book interview value as well. Um, but you've got a number of questions about Biden and should Biden debate and strategy. And before I ask you the question about Biden's debate and strategy, I want to point out that Biden had said uh, that he would provide no pardon to Trump and that he would leave it to an independent DOJ to make that decision. In other words, Biden, in my mind, was saying, we are going to restore the independence of the Department of Justice and the president will not interfere in political or a political appearing prosecution. Kamala Harris had a little more aggressive stance on it, but the, but the Biden answer that I heard uh, held out some hope. And I, I think while your prediction is true as what will happen pragmatically so that we don't appear to be perhaps a banana republic of sorts, uh, or that there'll be more pressing needs. This whole question of what do we do if Biden's elected is very interesting. But right now, I'd like to focus on the question of strategy for Biden. And one of the questions that came across was, should Biden debate Trump? And if he does, what should the strategy be? I think he, uh, Biden should absolutely debate Trump. Uh, and I think he will uh, give him his lunch and eat it. Uh, by that, I mean, Biden will mop the floor up with Trump. Trump is, is not knowledgeable. He 
uh, is not particularly quick or bright. Uh, he might be able to come up with a, a tweet, uh, but that's about the extent of his, uh, his knowledge. I, you know, Biden knows the government. I mean, he's, he has served for eight years as vice president. His, his uh, knowledge of the system is not that dated. All he's seen is Trump come in and try to disrupt what he and Obama were doing. He probably knows much more about the government than Trump does. So I think absolutely he should debate. And, uh, you know, Trump, Trump doesn't, did not hold up well against Hillary uh, as far as the substance of the debates and acted like a, a weirdo uh, following her around the stage in one of the debates. So I, it's not a comfortable form for Trump. Uh, it, 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 he, uh, his shtick only goes so far. So I think that those debates should, as I understand, there are three of them scheduled. They've got the, the single moderators. Uh, and I think they'll be important uh, revelations for some people. And hopefully, uh, while they won't change Trump voters and his supporters, who most of them won't even watch it, uh, they will. Uh, they will only be able to hear what they want to hear, and compartmentalize and dispose of anything they don't want to hear. With regard to the folks who would be shamed in your book, do you think it's statistically significant enough that there should be some particular targeting of those folks? You know, I, I, Barbara, I missed the first part of your question. With regard to the folks that are capable of shame, the kind of outer edges uh, that you mentioned in the book of the very few authoritarian yes. follows who might be persuadable. Is it significant enough that it's worth the effort and how does one approach those people? As I say, I think it's not, I don't think it's worth the effort uh, to, to get them. They may or may not come over of their own accord if they realize that they are a, bar, a coalition of of t deeply prejudiced people. It's, I think the time can be better spent and the energy should be better spent going after the young people. The young people uh, are widely polling as uh, anti-Trump and pro-Biden. And that's getting them to the polls is to me where Democrats should be focusing all their attention. Say, we don't care if you join us forever, we'd like to have you but we need you for this election and really make it a youth oriented drive in these last two months before we go to the polls. You know, you talk about critical thinking in the book. It's, it's the absence of critical thinking in the Trump followers and the authoritarians. Uh, do you have hope, John? Do you have hope? for the future and critical thinking? Oh, I, I definitely do. I wouldn't be bothering with the book if I had given up. Uh, you know, it, it is a frightening prospect to have a second Trump term. Uh, that's when we're in real trouble and are gonna take some real creativity and lawyers are gonna be busier than they have ever been doing litigation and things they never thought they would be doing to keep this democracy. Uh, and that's because Trump and his followers uh, are, they don't care about democracy. They don't care about the rule of law. And, uh, you know, you're not too far from Fort Knox. And I think it may need a, a citizen uh, patrol to guard that, or uh, it may be drained if Trump gets a second term. Uh, I, that was the first thing I told Mo when I, my wife, when, when he was elected, I said, God, I fear for Fort Knox. He's got this thing about gold uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, but I'm being alarmist and, I, uh, and that's being more facetious. So I, I do have hope. Uh, and as I say, I think young, you know, I, having young granddaughters, I know that they are energetic. What they don't know is what to do and how to do it. And that's why I think older people, rather than ignoring them and, and hoping that they'll do it on their own, that uh, the Democratic Party should reach out to youth in particular for this election and well, try to bring them in. I would have a specific request for you then on behalf of the several now emails I'm getting saying, bring him back, bring him back. Um, I, 
if you, if you would be so kind because people care so deeply about what you've done. And, and I, uh, from 1976, uh, felt I knew you very well after I read your book because you put so much of yourself into Blind Ambition, would ask you to come back and help strategize with these groups. Uh, even before you come, you could tell us uh, how we might make use of your book how we might make use of the specific strategies, particularly aimed at young people. Uh, and it needs to be fast, Mr. Dean, John. I agree. In fact, I, I'm actually talking to a very prominent democratic activist here in uh, Southern California who has my book and said, you know, I see in here a manual that you didn't write, but is in there as to what activists should know and be focusing on. And he's right. I, it was not written as it was written for a general reader. That didn't occur to us as we were doing it. But that's not difficult for me to fashion a guy, an activist guide to this book, and what they can take out of it, and why they should take it out. Okay, I'm getting offers all over the Zoom webinar chat to bring out young Dems if you'll come back, and people who just said they bought your books. So, okay. Um, we'll, we'll certainly come okay. back for you. Yes, the We've answer. Here, would you speak to the TYLA? That's the Texas Young Lawyers Association, John. Uh, so uh, let me say, uh, please come back. We may not have the most money in the world, but we got people who will uh, work with you and want to hear these specific recommendations that would be kind of the the uh, the the activist. I did I did not write this book for money. In fact, I have no. There was no. That's one of the reasons. You say that uh, what happened is my regular publisher, Viking Random House, and my editor, when I told them I was going to do this book, said, "John, we can't crash this book out. We already have our schedule loaded." I then called an old hand in the publishing business a former uh, Washington Post reporter who become the head of a major publishing house called Public Affairs, a fellow by the name of Peter Osnos. Well, I hadn't talked to Peter in years, but his son is at the New Yorker, Evan Osnos. And Evan had interviewed me a couple times for stories for the New Yorker. So I called Evan, I said, where's your dad? I need to talk to him. And he said, I'll get you in touch right away. And he did. I talked to Peter and I said, Peter, you used to be in the business of crashing books out quickly. I've got a book that needs to be crashed out before the election. I said, who can do it? And he said, Melville House. Uh, I didn't know them at all. I literally sent this book to them over the transom. Uh, they got it. Uh, never, uh, I'd never had any prior dealings with them. Within hours of them receiving my the the manuscript of the book, they said, we're very interested. And we happen to look at your record for prior books. You have remarkable sales. We, we, we like that. Uh, and so they were willing to take it on. They said, what kind of advance do you want? I said, I don't want any advance. Uh, I just want to get the book out and use that advance money for advertising to get it out as widely as we can. So that's the, uh, you know, that, that's the drill here, is get the information out. Well, thank you for the story about Melville House, and we love you, John. Thank, thank you, you again. Actually, you know, you, when you were talking about helping out Californians, I just saw the uh, Molly Ivins documentary. There was a, a support for the Texas Observer, which is a, a really good monthly magazine here in Texas. And she was talking in Berkeley, California, about why it's such a good thing to be a liberal in Texas. And she pointed out, who needs another liberal in Berkeley, California? Um, so we, we certainly, it's a great place to be a Democrat. It's a great place to be progressive. And thank you for all you're doing. Thank you, Barbara, for helping arrange this. Thank you again, Dr. Salter, Judge Jaworski. Hopefully we'll see you September 24th. If you haven't already joined and it's open to lawyers and non-lawyers, it's only $75 a year. Our link is acdla.com. Also, you'll have the ability to watch this, share this on our Facebook page tomorrow or the next day latest, as well as the other webinars that we've had. They're all recorded. They're all available for download and view later after that. Thank you again, everybody, and hope to see you on the 24th. We'll keep these free for as long as we can, and, and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Take care.